So uh, it's a great pleasure um, to welcome Jose, um, who on the, the strength of his contribution should be a dominating figure in our field. It's just that um, he's too nice a guy to do any dominating, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, he's nevertheless somebody that I've looked up to for a long time, so it's a great pleasure to have him here. And also something of a privilege because he's moves around a lot. <laughs> so often somewhere else, so we're quite, quite lucky to sort of nail him down for a few days. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, I mean, especially for organizing this and giving us. Uh, listeners to discuss this, these matters. Uh, I guess I should begin by saying that uh, talking about value <coughs> is, uh, some, can be a risky business, I guess, because it's, there are many ways to go about that and many ways to, to, to and several possible methodologies, uh, and especially, I guess, well, without having a common kind of background, it may be uh, a difficult thing, but also more interesting probably because of that. So my own take actually this time, uh, I'm not going to be talking about purity as opposed to deep connections, the kind of thing that David was talking about yesterday, which might have been a very interesting topic. Uh, but that's, uh, I, I actually decided to concentrate when I was preparing it, I decided to concentrate on the culture of pure mathematics as such. This nebulous uh, combination of things that go into the, the, the idea of pure mathematics. And yesterday I was actually thinking a little bit, I'm, I'm comfortable thinking, well maybe I was, not, I was not very wise in choosing this topic. Anyhow, it was uh, decided already, so I was thinking that. So, well of course, pure mathematics has been a, a very successful enterprise, and we are all very used to the image of Mathematics as a pure discipline, something that is fully autonomous from anything else. Uh, and in fact, uh, the typical 20th century image is of a discipline that is hardly comparable with the so called sciences. Right, right. So, um, this kind of image happened to, to, to become well, well established inside and outside the mathematics community. And this, it's interesting that this happened, uh, among other things, this happened in spite of the fact that the most influential mathematicians uh, 100 years ago, so in, the, the most influential people around 1900, did not believe in such an image of mathematics. So I'm thinking especially of Poincaré and Hilbert. <laughs> None of them agrees <coughs> with this image of mathematics, and yet it will become the uh, well-established uh, cultural image of mathematics in the, in the 20th century. Why? For several reasons. One of them is that it was shared by a large community of specialists. But I would emphasize, and uh, of course I will be discussing this, this topic from the point of view, I mean as a, as a result of my historical studies of several things in the 19th and early 20th century. So. Um, it, it, it's not only that it was shared by the community, it, it was strongly institutionalized, I would say, in mathematics departments. And so we have the social, cultural, institutional factors uh, into play. Uh, if one, recently we had a, a meeting in Germany on, which was about the transition from the pure mixed distinction which is the distinction you find in the 17th and 18th centuries. It's pure math mathematical topics versus mixed mathematics, which includes um, many things, but uh, not only astronomy, but also fortification, to, to give some examples. And well, uh, part of my, uh, my reflection on that topic is that I think that the pure mixed <coughs> distinction works differently from the pure applied distinction. So that's, uh, uh, well, it's, it can be a complicated topic. Anyhow, if you, I, I don't want to go into the details of that. Actually, the, the, the talks that were given in, in Nobel World Fund on this topic are available already, so they, they have been published already. So you can have a look there if you're interested. I just wanted to remind you that the, the distinction between pure and applied mathematics uh, emerges for the first time in Germany in the late 
18th century. Uh, apparently, even, even historians, German historians of mathematics were surprised that this was the case. Uh, there, there, was a, a, there seems to be a general belief that this happens in the 19th century, but that actually in Leipzig in 1790, you find the Leipziger Magazin für die Reine und Angewandte Mathematik. Uh, they are using uh, distinction pure versus applied mathematics exactly the same way as later, and actually it's not only that, there are several things going on, I think, in German mathematics in, around that time, which are coherent with this, uh, with this idea that there is something changing. I don't want to discuss that early period, I simply would like to, to suggest that there are seeds for this already in the late enlightenment in, in Germany, even before the, the famous reform of the university which will be, among other things, inspired by this uh, atmosphere. Um, increasingly, the thing will become pure mathematics as a discipline, and this is important, because uh, this is one of the reasons why it functions differently. The, the, pure, the, the older distinctions were inside a, a discipline, inside a body of, of knowledge, which was basically taken to be uh, well, coherent while uh, increasingly it, it, this will become a distinction at the border of the discipline. It's pure mathematics as a key discipline. And then there are other topics. There is applied mathematics, but the relations, depending where you go, uh, can be difficult. Uh, the, the, this development was led by German mathematicians and the German community. So they, they were the first to insist on this uh, self-conception of mathematics as pure pure science, pure discipline. You, can even, you could even argue that it was resisted in France or, or England. Or at, at the very least, things were not the same as, as in Germany. If you, if you look into, for instance, the 1850s, 1860s, there is a noticeable difference between the situation uh, in different countries. Oops, this was too long. <laughs> Four hours? <laughs> Maybe we are safe. Um, okay, so there are f famous stories about that. You probably all know this famous story about Jacobi, the German mathematician, writing to the French and explaining how Fourier is so wrong to think that uh, profound study of nature is the source of mathematical discoveries. He should have known better, he should have known that. Mathematics is uh, about the honor of the human mind and all of that. Uh, uh, well, uh, okay, so I want to discuss this. this sorry. Is it caught? Is it caught lurking in the background? Well, it's, uh, I would say, it's, I, I'm coming to that in, in a moment. It's neo humanism, more generally than Kant. Kant is a neo humanist. Uh, many people are. And of course, just to, to begin in a provocative way, I'm sorry to tell you that you know this already, uh, let me give you a quotation, a recent quotation by Arnold, an important mathematician, 15 years ago, writing about mathematics education, which is in a book about mathematics education, and say, saying this, mathematics is a part of physics. Physics is an experimental science, a part of natural science. Mathematics is the part of physics where experiments are cheap. This is <laughs> like a simply provocative analysis. Of course, I mean, this kind of experiment is quite cheap. It's not, I mean, it needs some money to have a blackboard, but no <laughs> uh, Probably he's provocative there, but I think here he's getting serious. In the middle of the 20th century, it was attempted to divide physics and mathematics. The consequence turned out to be catastrophic. All the relations of mathematics grew up without knowing half of their science and in total ignorance of any other sciences. He seems to be serious about this. So, uh, well, and simply to, to, to make the case that, of course, the, the image of pure mathematics that we normally have been taking for granted is not so self evident or uh, anything like that. So, uh, what I would like to, to do, maybe in our world, uh, and maybe coming back to this towards the end. I would like to discuss a little bit three different settings or periods and the ways in which the, the notion of purity or the ideology of purity or this insistence of, on, on the importance of pure mathematics uh, works in the, different, in the different periods. 
First, I will look at the, the early period, the first half of the 19th century, more or less. Um, then I will, I will maybe briefly make a few remarks on, on Göttingen, when it was the high time of Göttingen, the uh, first decade of the, of the 20th. And then, if I have time, I will move into saying a bit more about uh, the, the modernist period in the 20s and 30s. Uh, so let me begin with this. Well, this is also to some extent related, but I'm, I'm being, I will be, well, it's interesting that I was like to quote Shakespeare anyway. Um, so let me begin with, with the period of the Humboldtian reform and, and with Gauss in particular, but instead of, I, I'll come back to that. Let me begin with this quote here. Uh, this is Weierstrass in uh, lecture notes of 1874. And it, this is one among the many examples you can give of people making use of this notion of purity and doing, well, uh, making it do some methodological work or orienting mathematics in a certain way. And if you don't know the, the quotation, then it's interesting in, in, in itself. So he's talking about his aim to give a purely arithmetical, purely arithmetical, definition of the complex numbers and saying that the geometrical representation is not an explanation but only a sensorial representation while the arithmetical representation is a real explanation of the complex magnitudes. And he goes on to say that even in, in the work of Gauss you find that, you find already in Gauss not, not just what everybody knows that he discussed the, the geometrical representation but he also discussed how to organize a purely arithmetical foundation, and so on and so forth. He even says that even if the geometrical representation is an essential means for research, well, that's a different issue. There's, so here, talk about uh, purity and purely arithmetical approach is, is doing many things, actually. This is a very rich text. Um, it's we, we find many things, some of them will be different, uh, significantly different from 20th century ideas about what is going on. There is here the idea of uh, an internal order of things in mathematics, something like the, the real order of reasons in, 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 the, in the world of mathematics. I'm thinking of Paul Tsao, by the way. Uh, uh, so that there is something like a true foundation of things. And, various classes in the, in the search for this true foundation, uh, there are essential distinctions among, among branches of mathematics, like this distinction uh, between geometry, which is regarded as applied in this period. This is uh, topos in, among German mathematicians, starting with Gauss, and then Weierstrass, Dedekind, and several others. They will be saying that geometry is applied because it has to do, of course, they are thinking about uh, physical space the geometry of physical space, uh, while, um, while uh, analysis, algebra, in general arithmetic, are pure. So they have these uh, essential distinctions between different uh, branches of mathematics. And it's very interesting, in particular in this case, that Weierstrass is, uh, is bringing into the topic the idea of explanation, so that this explanation is only such when you are going the pure way, so when you're going in the way of the true foundations of the, of the topic, uh, while uh, the geometric representation is impure, this is implied of course, even though it may be an essential means. Okay, so where, where do these things come from? Uh, and, and more generally than simply, uh, I, it's a bit perhaps that I, I will not discuss so much the particular an example here, maybe it would have been a good idea, but I, I, I decided, as I say, to concentrate more on the, on the culture of pure mathematics and to try to see uh, where it comes from and uh, what is sustaining it and what kind of uh, implications it is having. So, this to one thing which I think there is agreement, basic agreement among, among people <coughs> discussing this topic, this identification of pure mathematics with, with arithmetic, this famous arithmetization of pure mathematics, was quite a strongly a German development. It's, it's not only in Germany that we find it, but it's particularly strong 
among German mathematicians. Uh, more precisely, if you look more closely, they, they tend to be people located in, in, in northern Germany, so in Russia, or in Göttingen, sorry about this, but historians <laughs> engage in this kind of funny uh, uh, thinking. Of, uh, um, you, you can find actually a long, you have a rather long history of uh, different attempts to, to, to reorganize arithmetic and to make a, well, different attempts to, to present the, the number system in all its extension in the correct way. Uh, when we talk about that, I'm not going to talk about that. But um, what I would like to emphasize is something else. This kind of ideas you can find, for instance, related ideas, you can find already very early. In particular, the case of Gauss is quite interesting. I have written about this in, in, in a chapter on Gauss, which you can find if you're interested in this uh, quite impressive volume they, they put together, which is called The Shaping of Arithmetic, uh, which was done for the second centenary of the Disquisitionis. So there, my, my chapter in that is not about number theory so much in particular. It's, it's about more like this general uh, shift in, in, in uh, general mathematics and uh, already as, as early as 1808 for instance you have the inaugural lecture that Gauss gives in Göttingen when he's uh, for the first time director of the observatory there and he that's quite interesting to read from this point of view from the point of view of, of understanding the, the, the cultural setting in which uh, there will be more and more an emphasis on the idea that mathematics as practiced in the university setting has to be pure mathematics. Uh, well, to, to make the story short, this is of course related to the Humboldtian reform, but uh, already to say that you find this in Gauss before the founding of Berlin is to say that it's not simply a, a result of Humboldt and his influence on, on, the, on the university. I was uh, already before I was pointing out that uh, there seem to be strong uh, motives already in the German Enlightenment, in particular in the fact that they were emphasizing a philosophical treatment of, of mathematics. Uh, this, this was becoming commonplace among German-speaking people, uh, starting perhaps with 18th century professors in getting them, like Kestner. Some of you know well, the, the name of Kestner. Uh, then you find it in other people, philosophers like Herbert or uh, Monsanto, uh, several different people. So they, they will start doing things that are relatively new, in like proving what everybody what everybody already knows, proving carefully what everyone already knows, uh, considering insisting on the more what they what they might call the more speculative part of, of mathematics, so the foundations of the, of the topic, uh, and insisting, this was very typical of the period, you can think of Leibniz in connection with this, insisting, or Bolzano, insisting on the objective order of grounding things, that there is something that undercover that you may uh, unearth and, 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 and find. Well, in the case of Gauss, to, to give you another example, Gauss in 1811, this is a famous letter to Bessel where he's discussing uh, uh, function theory and complex integration. But he, he's, at, at the very beginning of the letter, he says, Here it is not a question of practical utility. I take analysis to be an autonomous science. This is already quite a nice statement of the spirit of pure mathematics. We disregard completely how important analysis may be for the sciences, for astronomy, for anything else. He knows a little bit about that, of course. He's, <laughs> but <laughs> he insists on, on this idea of an autonomous science. And this, this is actually quite typical of the, of the period. As I'm saying here, this is not Gauss, by the way. This is not a quotation from Gauss. But this is actually, I think it is, I took it from Paulsen, who has little to do with this. Somebody reflecting, late in the 19th century, reflecting about the reorganization of the universities and the reorganization of the educational system in Germany. 
And, but you, you can apply this to mathematics as, as, as much as you can apply it to other topics. In general, they, there was this, in, in order for mathematics to be a suitable discipline to be practiced in a philosophical faculty, which for those of you, well, I suppose everybody knows this, I mean, that in, in, the, in the 19th century, the place was the philosophy faculty where you can find the humanities, the sciences, and uh, so you can find Hegel, and his colleague is a uh, chemist, and the other colleague is, uh, right, it's not exactly what we are used to think. Uh, this idea that it has to be elevated to the dignity of a well-ordered philosophical science. This, there is a cluster here of different uh, ideas, talking about systems, systematic presentation, talking about uh, paying attention to the foundations of, of the speculative part, and, uh, well, talking uh, this, this idea that the philosophical aspects will be important. All of these issues, uh, to make uh, one of the ideas in my talk uh, more specific, all of these issues are quite different from the pure mathematics of the, of the 20th century. They are, tend to be things that will disappear uh, in, in all of these worries or, or interests. Uh, and as you all know, well, in, in the new German university system, which is going to be very successful and will be uh, implemented or be inspiration for, for reforms in other places, and there was this idea of an uh, for well, several different uh, ideas, all of which are consistent with this uh, reorientation. Uh, the famous idea of science for its own sake, that you have to practice science for its own sake. This is the idea of pure science, and in particular in the case of mathematics, emphasizing pure mathematics. Uh, the idea that the, well, the fact that this whole reorientation is part of, is, um, is uh, based on an educational ideal, which in the case of the German system typically is discussed in terms of the notion of Bildung, which you might try to translate as something like the integral formation of the individual. It is not at all specialized training. It's quite the opposite. Uh, so, for instance, for integral Bildung, uh, the, the platonic ideas about uh, education are relevant the Bible is relevant, of course. Uh, perhaps a simple, a very simplistic presentation is Plato plus the Bible. Already get, gets you quite close to, to German reading on this time. Uh, and, and there is Pausen in, in the, the, the work in which he's dis discussing this, and many other people have emphasized this idea of neo humanism as a very important inspiration. So, well, inspired in the humanism of the Renaissance, but with some new new elements, among which is quite prominent in Germany the importance of philosophy, of philosophical training, philosophical reflection. Uh, and, and, and it's this kind of orientation, so science for its own sake, uh, the idea that the university is designed to be uh, an environment in which you can live the sciences, devote all of your effort and, and so on to the sciences, which uh, is often linked with the notion of pure contemplation. I could give you also Rao's explaining to a colleague how much he values the, those who, who do things in the spirit of pure contemplation. Uh, uh, and the famous idea of unity of teaching and research. Okay, all of this of course co conflicts with specialization. So it, it, it is part, part of the famous conflict that many people uh, discussed in the 20th century, and you probably know examples of this, uh, the painful experience that the, one has to be specializing more and more, and that the universities and the sciences are becoming specialized, uh, narrow uh, activities. Part of that is, of course, the conflict with the previous uh, inspiration and the previous uh, setting in the, in, the, in the 19th century, which had been uh, quite successful, and which actually led, uh, the, the way I present this, or the, the, in, in particular in, in my, that paper I mentioned on, on Gauss, is, well, you can actually, if you know the famous Forman argument about Weimar science and quantum physics, I think this one is even stronger. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, this, this is a stronger version of that, because it's actually, the, uh, 
there are many signs of this. For instance, what, some of the signs you see is that um, uh, 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 well, the, the distinction between the, in, 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 in the 19th century in Germany, the technical schools as a setting and the universities as a setting, the kind of mathematics you will see in one setting, the kind of mathematics you will see in the other setting. Uh, this is reflected also at the level of journals, these kinds of uh, it, it is reflected not only in the field of mathematics, it is reflected also in, in other scientific fields. Chemistry, you will see the technical chemistry, which have been a very important topic, and there were even, I think in Berlin, there was a chair for technical chemistry at the time of Hegel. That, that, will, be, that, that will disappear, that kind of thing. Because as part of the reform, as part of the new kind of environment, anything that is so closely related with utilitarian goals, doesn't really have a place at, at, the, at the Russian university. Uh, uh, so, there are many signs of how you find this process of adaptation of the scientists to a particular institutional milieu which has a very strong uh, orientation and, and values guiding it. And this, all, this whole cluster of ideas about purity, I think, I, that, that's the way I was thinking about the topic, identify a, well, a, a cluster of values that is, uh, the, the important idea is that it is strongly institutionalized and in being so is affecting the orientation of the discipline. Of course, it could have been a disaster. That's, uh, let's do a little bit of counterfactual history. It could have been a disaster. It could have ruined mathematics. And, and, uh, but it, it was not. It turned out to be the case that <coughs> devoting yourself to pure mathematical problems was productive enough. And there were good things to do. Uh, good ideas about how to develop the, the discipline and, and good programs, research programs and all of that. So if you want to look at it this way, it was a very happy historical coincidence that the development of these new projects and programs in, in the orientation of pure mathematics happened at the time when the institutional setting was strongly promoting that. My argument is that uh, this uh, this gives uh, well, a very strong uh, position to this uh, cultural image of, of, of pure mathematics because it is heavily institu institutionalized in several different ways. It is very successful, so at some point the French will start thinking we are lagging behind, we have to go the same way as the, as the Germans are going, and then will come some other people. The Americans will start sending their students to Germany, they will learn with Felix Klein, they will get imbibed in this funny, strange European German uh, spirit, and they will bring it back even to the United States, which is, I don't know if you agree with me, but it's, it should be regarded as a little bit of a surprise that in a, such a pra pragmatically oriented, practically uh, oriented utilitarian context, as, as the American context was, in, especially in that time, for very good reasons, you find this development of mathematics departments oriented along the lines of this very funny European, Northern European uh, spirit. Uh, okay. So, of course, this fits very well several things uh, like uh, the, the success that uh, uh, even very unpractical branches of mathematics, that's the way they, they thought at the time, like number theory were being practiced and being the most highly regarded among the German mathematicians or the, how, this, how this trend of arithmetization develops and the kinds of, of uh, uh, configuration it, it adopts. Uh, but it's important at the same time to, to I think, to keep in mind that, uh, well, by the way, I was forgetting to give you one more very nice uh, quotation Talking about the very early period, Felix Klein comes to my help in, a, in a, the most clear way. He's talking about, in his famous lectures on the history of mathematics in the 19th century, he's talking about the first important research seminar uh, for mathematics, 